from a scientific point of view, what we say is that don't touch. Don't touch the body, don't touch the body fluids. And if there's been an Ebola patient, decontaminate with bleach so that it doesn't get onto the things that we may put on our mouth or touch in another way. There's something schooly around here. We at last! He can be taught! I you can't handle the truth! I love to see your praise. Well, hello, fellow Catholics out there in internet land, uh, and welcome to Cafeteria Catholics, where Catholicism. Uh, Makes sense, and we are coming to you from the awesome city of Lexington, Kentucky, via Spreaker and iHeartRadio. Drop us a line, cafeteria Catholics, yahoo.com. Let us know whether you like the show, whether you hate the show, whether you love uh, the show. And I am your humble host, Ephraim Cortez. I can't live it down, fellow Catholics, okay? I, ju- I just can't let it go. You know how you work for that magic moment, right? You work for a magic moment. Ever watch A Few Good Men? Right, that great movie with Tom Cruise, that courtroom movie. You can't handle the truth! And you've got that final scene with Jack Nicholson. It was uh, one of those moments, right, where you've got the guy cornered, right? And Tom Cruise, he says, can you explain that? Right? Can you explain that? It's it's just one of those moments. I thought last time on the show, and I had that clip, or actually I didn't have the clip. I did not have the clip, fellow Catholics. And I lost sleep over that. You know, we're talking about Ebola, making it into the concrete jungle of New York City, right? From the jungles of West Africa into the jungles of New York City. Ebola! (laughs) And rather than coming away with this magic moment, this clinching moment, fellow Catholics, I come away with egg on my face. I just, I can't stand it, right? And it's not a pride thing. It's not, right? It's not a pride thing. It's more of a uh, perfectionist thing. Right? I hate it when things don't work out the way that you plan them. Right? And of course, I mean, we all know that old saying, you want to make God laugh, make plans. Right? And I understand that. But when you work so hard all day long to create this moment, not only for, for myself, because I'm, really, I'm not really thinking about myself. I mean, I want to make a point, and I want to make a convincing point, But I want to do it for your sake, fellow Catholics, right? Because I believe that there's there's an agenda going on here with this whole Ebola issue, right? There is a political agenda underneath the whole thing. And the Pope-Bama government, Obama, the miraculous, the guy that was going to lower the sea levels, but yet can't... (laughs) can't stop flights, can't ban flights from West Africa into the United States. And now here we have Ebola in New York City because the guy just won't do the right thing. And so it's political in my opinion, right? Just won't do the right thing. Just will not do it, fellow Catholics. And now Ebola. Ebola, fellow Catholics, in the the con in the concrete jungle of New York City, fellow Catholics, right? And he's got some political hacks, you know, posing as doctors, political hacks, posing as czars, Ebola czars. This guy, Ron Klain, knows nothing. Sounds like a villain in a Die Hard movie, right? Ron Klain. (laughs) What is that? Right? 
but the guy knows nothing about infectious diseases. The guy is a lawyer. And so you, you know, I mean, I haven't even heard this guy speak, have you? But when he does, you know it's going to be a whole lot of spin. A whole lot of word manipulation, fellow Catholics. And that's what we've been getting from uh, the Pope Obama administration on this issue anyway. Not just this issue, but this is just the latest issue. We've gotten nothing but spin from the beginning of the Pope Obama administration. Right? Nothing but spin. Hope and change. Hope and change. Look, uh, hope is gone. All hope is gone in the Pope Bum administration. Yes, we can. No, we can't. That's what it's turned into. It's not, yes, we can. It's, no, we can't. We can't stop flights from West Africa into the United States. We can't let you keep your doctor. We can't let you keep your health care plan. It's the the presidency of no, we can't. Not yes, we can. Right? But the point, fellow Catholics, right? I, I, I had this moment in mind, right? Worked for it all day long and then the moment comes and I end up with egg on my face so I hate it fellow Catholics right and so I thought that it would be fitting to start to show off with that clip right and you've already heard it at the top of the show we're gonna play it again right because I feel like I have to redeem myself here <laughs> so we're gonna play it again right but as you know this doctor this doctor, doctor, is it Dr. Spencer, right? And God bless the guy, right? God bless the guy. Goes out there to West Africa. He is risking his own life for the benefit of others, right? And the guy is a white doctor, okay? Not that it matters, but given the fact that we, America, we as Americans, the, the United States, we are being labeled as racists, or at least those of us who are suggesting that flights from West Africa into the United States should be banned until we get control of this outbreak in, you know, these West African countries, right? We are racists simply because we care about the well-being of our fellow Americans, right? So we have to mention that this guy is white, right? Because he's over there in West Africa helping black people that supposedly we are discriminating against because we as Americans we uh, just don't want to be infected with a deadly virus has nothing to do with West Africans has everything to do with Ebola fellow Catholics just as in 1905 we isolated the uh, the disease of leprosy not necessarily the people Unfortunately, it was the people, Americans, who carried the disease, and so we had to isolate these people, not necessarily because of... Uh, we weren't necessarily isolating the people. We had to isolate the disease for which, at the time, we had no cure, right? We did not want an outbreak of leprosy in the United States and so the right thing to do was to isolate the disease not necessarily the people and so we isolated uh, isolated these people for 16 years off the uh, coast of Massachusetts and then after that we isolated them in Carville Louisiana for a number of years fellow Catholics until we finally gained control on this disease of leprosy, right? Or Hansen's disease, at, as uh, it's come to be called. But the point being, we did the right thing. And it wasn't that we were being racist, uh, you know, from the pictures that I've seen, these people that were uh, isolated off the coast of Massachusetts and in Carville, Louisiana, uh, most of these people were white, right? So we were not discriminating right 
we were discriminating against a disease, right? We wanted to isolate the disease, not the person. And, you know, the same is true here. The same is true here. You know, you've got Thomas Frieden arguing, the, the director of the CDC, arguing against charter flights, but then goes on to say that he was stuck for a week at some airport, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, in all actuality, he's arguing for charter flights, right? Because charter flights go directly, right, to, to their destination, right? Don't have to make any stops except for maybe, you know, refueling, right? But they are not going to have the complications that a commercial, uh, a commercial flight might have, right? It's it's uh, he's arguing for charter flights. Doesn't make sense, right? Commercial flights get stuck in airports, so hey, why not charter flights? But uh, every excuse under the book, or every excuse in the book, uh, is being thrown out there by these people as to why they cannot ban flights from West Africa into the United States. Just can't do it. Right? And it's because there's a political agenda. As I said last time on the show, or a couple of shows back, they have an agenda. Illegal immigration. Amnesty for illegal immigrants. And already, uh, after I made those comments, that same week, later in that week, we get a report that the Pope Bomb administration, they are ordering 37 million IDs over the next several years for illegal immigrants, fellow Catholics. And so you see, they do not want us to make the correlation with this Ebola situation that we have going on now and banning uh, people from, uh, from coming into this country. And making that correlation with the amnesty agenda for illegal immigrants that they have in the works, fellow Catholics. They don't want us to make that correlation because if we can stop people from flying in from some other far-off country into the United States, then certainly we can stop people from coming in from neighboring countries, from walking in from neighboring countries from sneaking in, from uh, climbing a fence into our country from some neighboring country, fellow Catholics, right? And so they don't want us to make that connection, right? There's a political agenda, and Ebola has become political. And because of this political agenda, we now have Ebola in New York City, fellow Catholics. Okay? And this guy, this... Dr. Spencer, right, the guy is a doctor, has worked with Ebola patients. He knows firsthand how deadly this disease can be. Firsthand. He's seen it, right? He has perhaps seen people die from Ebola. And so he knows. He knows the ramifications of not quarantining a person who has Ebola, or in this case, himself, right? And yet, he goes out there, goes into the subway system, fellow Catholics, goes out bowling. He, he probably touched every ball <laughs> in this bowling alley, fellow Catholics. They've got the place, the place uh, locked down over there in New York City. They've got this bowling alley locked down, being... Uh, 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 decontaminated, right? Uh, uh, because we have no idea what this guy has touched, right? And of course, last time on the show as we were talking, there was this reporter who said that there has not been a case found of uh, uh, Ebola being transmitted through uh, a dry surface, fellow Catholics, right? And this was my shining moment. It was supposed to be my shining moment. It was supposed to be that magic moment that I worked for all day long. Right? 
and I did not have the clip, right? But they have been told in New York, according to this reporter, that Ebola cannot be caught from a dry surface, fellow Catholics. And let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and play that clip. Let's make sure that I have the right one, fellow Catholics. Let's go ahead and play that clip. The reporter, the New York reporter, stating that they have been informed that we cannot catch Ebola. Ebola is not transmitted through a dry surface. And even though we now know that Spencer took several subway trips, we're being told by public health authorities not to panic about that. It is extremely unlikely that he could have transmitted Ebola to anybody else on those trains. In fact, any sort of transmission from a, a dry surface to a person has never been found. So, a case of Ebola being transmitted through a dry surface from one person to another has never been found, fellow Catholics. And yet, the CDC director, Tom Frieden, Mr. Confusion, fellow Catholics, right? Mr. Confusion goes to Liberia, and first he says that the Ebola virus can only be transmitted through two streams, right? Two streams, that's it. Let's go ahead and play that clip first. He knows, he says, he knows, or we know, how Ebola is spread. We know how it spreads. It spreads by just two means, two streams. And if we block both of those streams, we will end the outbreak. The first stream is taking care of people with Ebola disease. So if someone is sick, if we touch them or their body fluids, we can contract Ebola. So if you touch a person, right, if you touch someone who has Ebola, that's one way. The other way is if you touch their body fluids. That's it, right? And so it seems that the reporter is right. You cannot catch it by touching a dry surface that has been touched by a person who has Ebola. And so, New Yorkers, you have nothing to worry about. Doesn't matter that this doctor with Ebola, the Ebola doctor, it doesn't matter that he was out there in the subway and touching bowling balls at the bowling alley. It doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter if he uh, exchanged uh, uh, money, currency with, uh, with, with, with uh, this person or that person at the bowling alley or perhaps at the subway, right? Maybe he had to buy, uh, uh, I know you guys don't have tokens anymore, right? That's back when I was growing up. Back when I was growing up in the uh, South Bronx, fellow Catholics, you would have to buy tokens to get on to the subway. Right, but today they have these the these cards, right? Kind of like a debit card, except that you load money onto it so that you can get onto the the subway system, right? So maybe he loaded some money onto the the metro card there, right? They have these little uh, machines, right? That you can uh, go to. And you can punch in how much money you want on the card and so forth. So maybe he played around with this, uh, with this machine at the subway system, right? Touched it all over the place. How many people, do you think, could have become infected in that way? But hey, then again, Thomas Frieden, the CDC director, told people in Liberia that you can't catch it that way. Or at least he says that... Uh, uh, there's only two ways of catching it. You have to touch a person who has Ebola or their body fluids. That's it, right? But yet later, in that same conference that he had in Liberia, he says the following. From a scientific point of view, what we say is that don't touch. Don't touch the body. Don't touch the body fluids. And... If there's been an Ebola patient, 
decontaminate with bleach so that it doesn't get onto the things that we may put on our mouth or touch in another way. So, <laughs> obviously, there's a third way. At first, he says there's only two ways. You have to directly touch the person or their body fluids. Two streams. That's it. But then later he says, if you are, if you've touched a person uh, who has Ebola, you need to decontaminate with bleach, right? So that if you touch anything that you might put in your mouth, or touch in some other way, right? So obviously, he is wor uh, worried that Ebola could spread through the touching of dry surfaces, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't say decontaminate before you touch anything, right? But this is exactly what he said. Let's go ahead and play it again, fellow Catholics, because of course, I am seeking redemption here, <laughs> fellow Catholics. Let's go ahead and play it one more time. From a scientific point of view, what we say is that don't touch. Don't touch the body, don't touch the body fluids. And if there's been an Ebola patient, decontaminate with bleach so that it doesn't get onto the things that we may put on our mouth or touch in another way. So that it doesn't get onto the things that we might put in our mouth or touch in other ways, right? So, this kind of blows that whole idea out of the water that Ebola is not transmitted from one person to another by the touching of dry surfaces, right? Kind of blows that whole thing out of the water, fellow Catholics. And so, uh, these people, I don't think that they even know how Ebola is spread, fellow Catholics. I was listening to this documentary on YouTube. I was watching this documentary on, on YouTube on Ebola. Back in the 80s, they had an outbreak, and I forget where, but it was in an African country, right? And these monkeys, they had the Ebola virus, right? And they had these monkeys in a building somewhere, and on the other side of the building, they had more monkeys that did not have the Ebola virus. But somehow, in spite of the fact that these monkeys, they were on the other side of the building, not infected with the Ebola virus, they caught Ebola. Or Ebola was transmitted onto them, in spite of the fact they were on the other side of the building. And the only thing that the scientists could come up with was that it spread through the air vents, fellow Catholics. In other words, it was uh, it went airborne. Ebola spread through the air. And many experts, they are not ruling that out, that Ebola can spread through the air. Not ruling it out. In close, in close quarters, Ebola can spread through the air, they say. Or at least, they are not ruling it out. And so for the CDC director to go to West Africa and say that there's only two ways by which uh, Ebola can be spread, this is just simply irresponsible, fellow Catholics, because I don't think we know. I don't think we know. And as we've talked about, uh, viruses, they mutate. They mutate, fellow Catholics. And even Obama himself, Pope Obama himself, fellow Catholics, last time on the show we heard him say that Ebola, in the future, perhaps, could become a virus, a deadlier virus, that might spread through the air. Remember that? There may come a time, sometime in the future, uh, where we are dealing with a airborne disease that is much easier to catch and is deadly. And uh, in some ways, this uh, has created a trial run for uh, federal, state, and local. So uh, it's a trial run, fellow Catholics. You know, that's, this is how he sees it. It's just a trial run. You know, some people might die. Some American people might die. 
it's just a trial run for you know our, our healthcare system right just a trial run but it could become airborne could become more deadly and he just he, he's kind of laid back about it doesn't re it's like He's not even bothered by it, fellow Catholics, right? I mean, could you imagine if this was taking place under George W. Bush, fellow Catholics, the dunce, George W. Bush, as he was made out to be by the mainstream media, day in and day out for eight years, fellow Catholics, right? The dunce, George W. Bush, imagine if he said something like that, right? And the way in which Obama says it, right? If George Bush would have done that, they would have run him out of office with, with, with a pitchfork, fellow Catholics. There may come a time, sometime in the future, uh, where we are dealing with a airborne disease that is much easier to catch and is deadly. Well, thanks so much, Obama. Thanks so much, for your concern, because it, it seems like uh, you're not concerned at all, right? It might become airborne. Then how about stopping those flights from West Africa into the United States? Mr. President Obama, the miraculous Obama, who was going to lower the sea levels. Remember that. The miraculous Obama who is going to lower our health care costs. Can't even do that, right? Health care costs were going to go down by $2,500 a month, fellow Catholics. Remember that? You were going to be able to keep your doctor. You were going to be able to keep your health care plan, if you liked your health care plan. He was going to uh, mend the wounds and the torn relationship with the United States and Muslim countries. And that's worked out so well for uh, the miraculous Obama, fellow Catholics, right? And the guy who was going to do all of these things cannot ban flights from West Africa into the United States in spite of the fact that 35 other countries have done so, fellow Catholics. 35 other countries have done so. And yet, the most powerful country in the world can't pull that off. But as we pointed out, this is just a, it's, it's a lie. It is a lie. Because George W. Bush, after 9-11, for three days, he banned flights from this country into any country in the world. For three days. And so, George W. Bush, the dunce, the idiot... He did the impossible. Remember, Pope Obama said that it's impossible to do this, right? We cannot seal ourselves off from a certain region of the world, right? And the reason we can't do that is because he wants us to believe that we can't seal ourselves off from Mexico. We can't seal ourselves off from illegal immigrants in Guatemala. Right? This is what he wants us to believe. We can't, it's impossible. We can't seal ourselves off from a certain region of the world. And yet, George W. Bush sealed us off from every region in the world. Can you explain that? <laughs> Can you explain that, fellow Catholics? You can't handle the truth! I love that movie. I love that movie, so awesome movie you know maybe it's the paralegal in me but that, that's probably the best courtroom drama ever put up uh, put on film fellow Catholics can you explain that <laughs> can you explain how it is that George W Bush the dunce who has been vindicated by the way he's been vindicated because uh, weapons of mass destruction were found all over Iraq throughout the entire war, right? So he's been vindicated. But can you explain how George W. Bush, the dunce, pulled off the impossible and sealed 
the United States off from every region in the world, and yet the president who was going to do the impossible, Barack Hussein Obama, can't seal us off from a sole region in the world. Can you explain that? <laughs> Can you explain that? You can't handle the truth! Incredible, fellow Catholics. But there it is. There it is. That clip, fellow Catholics. Okay? I finally got it right, fellow Catholics. And hopefully, uh, the point's been made. The point has been made, fellow Catholics, that perhaps these people have no idea how it is that Ebola spreads. From a scientific point of view, what we say is that don't touch. Don't touch the body. Don't touch the body fluids. And if there's been an Ebola patient, decontaminate it with bleach so that it doesn't get onto the things that we may put on our mouth or touch in another way. How many things did uh, this Dr. Spencer touch while on the New York City subway? How many things? How many bowling balls did he exchange money? Obviously, he had to exchange money at the bowling alley with uh, someone there at the counter, right? He had to get bowling shoes. Had to pay for however many games he played. Perhaps he got a couple of beverages there. Right? Maybe he knocked back a, a couple of beers. Right? He exchanged money, I'm sure. Right? And now they are going to have to track. And yeah, this is probably impossible to do, right? But they are going to make you believe... You know, this Ron Klain, he's probably going to make an appearance at some point, and he is go going to try and make you believe, manipulate you through the language into believing that, hey, you're fine. There's no reason to worry, right? Because we know how it spreads. Two streams, right? Sounds so, so good, right? Two streams, right? Two streams uh, of... of, of of ways in which you can transmit Ebola. That's it. Right? So they'll get Ron Klain, and he'll get up there, you know, the <laughs> the villain from Die Hard, he'll get up there, and he'll explain to us, and he'll put us at ease, right? That we don't have to worry. Because Ebola does not spread by, you know, by, 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 by dry surfaces doesn't spread that way. Well, if it doesn't spread that way, then why are you so interested in tracking, uh, tracking all of these people down who were on the train with this guy, right? If that's not a, how it spreads, then why are you so concerned with finding all of these people, right? Which is going to be impossible. As I said, wouldn't it be a whole lot easier to simply just ban flights from West Africa into the United States until this whole outbreak is just under control, right? Can we do that instead? Wouldn't that be a whole lot easier? If only to ease the fear of the American people, right? I mean, just, you know, uh, from that aspect, it's the common sense thing to do. You don't want panic. In New York City. You don't want panic in Texas, right? You don't want panic throughout the nation. And so, just for the sake of easing the minds of the American people, wouldn't it make sense to uh, put a stop to flights from West Africa into the United States, if only for that reason? But you see, the arrogance of this president will not allow him to do so. And of course we know that there's something much bigger than that at stake here for this administration. Illegal immigration. Illegal immigration. This is what they are worried about. Illegal immigration. This president is he is about to uh, violate the law 
after the midterm election. Once again, he is going to violate the Constitution, and he is going to uh, declare amnesty for millions of people, millions of lawbreakers in this great country of ours, right? And uh, he doesn't want us to make the connection between banning uh, West Africans, people from an another nation, from coming into the United States doesn't want us to be able to uh, for us to be able to make that connection with uh, people coming in from Mexico, coming in from Guatemala and all these uh, you know neighboring countries. Doesn't want us to make that connection. Doesn't want us to hinder uh, his uh, his uh, political agenda. He wants those votes for his party. This is what it's all about, fellow Catholics, right? And don't forget, in a couple of weeks, we are going to have an election, fellow Catholics. Let's send out a message to the Pope Obama administration, the, the, the uh, Democrat Party, right? Because these guys, they were in charge, what, for un until 2010, right? Until 2010, they had the Senate, they had the Congress, and they had the Oval Office. So they were in charge, fellow Catholics. They, ha uh, they had a chance to get it right. And they have not. They have not, fellow Catholics, right? The Republicans, they gained control of the Congress two years ago. Two years ago. So all of this time, the Democrats, they've been in charge, fellow Catholics. And what have they done to this country? 92 million uh, and a half people in this country cannot find a job. In spite of the fact that, uh, that unemployment number, fellow Catholics, is perhaps the biggest lie... That has uh, that this well next to Obamacare, perhaps the biggest lie that has been concocted by this administration, fellow Catholics. All right, because they are simply not counting these uh, 93 million people who cannot find a job. They are simply not counting them. If you threw those people into the mix unemployment would be a lot higher than that number of what is it five five point eight percent unemployment five point nine percent unemployment you really believe that how many people do you personally know who are out of work who want to work how many people do you know are on food stamps who don't want to be on food stamps because they want to do it on their own they want to work but they can't find a job fellow Catholics right So let's, let's send these people a message. The party of the little guy. Uh, th that's another lie, fellow Catholics. They've never been for the little guy. The black man, he was uh, the little guy back in the 1800s. What did they do to the little guy back in the 1800s? They enslaved him. The Democrat Party, fellow Catholics, do not forget. It was the Democrat Party who spoke build their own blood throughout this great nation of ours in order to keep slavery going, fellow Catholics. Not to end it, but to keep it going. The Democrat Party. This is the same party that in 1964 filibustered the Civil Rights Act. We would have no Civil Rights Act were it not for the Republican Party. In 1969... The Democrat Party voted against anti-lynching legislation in this country. In 1969, that's not that long ago, fellow Catholics, okay? The Democrat Party voted against anti-lynching legislation. In other words, they wanted the black man to hang in this country, fellow Catholics, okay? And let's say, uh, we don't have to say anything about abortion, right? 
the party of the little guy will not even let the little guy out of the womb. How can you be a Catholic in good standing with Holy Mother Church and vote Democrat? How does that happen? How does that wash? It does not wash, fellow Catholics. Doesn't wash. But anyway, let's go ahead and take a break. Man, I've been talking <laughs> for 40 minutes, fellow Catholics. Let's go ahead and take a break, and we will see you on the other side. Please, fellow Catholics, do not touch that mouse. What comes to mind when you think of confession? You might be feeling like, I'm afraid. What's the priest going to think of me? Or, since God loves me and forgives me, do I really need to tell my sins to a priest? Or maybe, if I go to confession, I'll feel awkward telling the priest everything, so maybe I should just wait. Well, it's time to understand that these distractions are keeping us away from the healing and saving graces that come from this incredible sacrament of reconciliation. Jesus loves to forgive us. He wants to reconcile us with our Father, a relationship broken through sin. Remember, reconciling our relationship with God was Jesus' idea in the first place. And since God created us, He knows what will really bring us peace. When we are set free from our burdens and are forgiven and healed, we can truly be joyful again. And after we shed our sins in the confessional, we'll feel like a hundred pound weight is lifted off. And the best part is that Jesus loves to forgive. He's anxious to forgive. Will we give Him that chance? We are Catholics. We are the Church. Together, we build and run hospitals, schools, shelters. We feed the hungry. We comfort the afflicted. We serve all who come. We do this in ways large and small because we are called to do it. We live in a country that promises to protect the right to practice our faith every day, everywhere. That right does not start when we enter our churches. That right does not end when we leave our pews. We are Catholics. We are Americans. We will defend our right to practice our faith free from government coercion. Join us. Together, we will be heard. Pero cuando llega diciembre, lo que queremos es lechón, lechón, lechón. That's right. He can be taught. Oh, yeah. Ya llegó diciembre. Lo que quiero es lechón. Free at last. Cuando termina noviembre, ya yo estoy bien preparado. Nunca falta el lechoncito para comérmelo asado. Porque todas las parrandas, cuando llegan al balcón, lo primero que te piden es... What's going on, fellow Catholics? Victor Manuel, lechón, lechón, lechón. We are back, Cafeteria Catholics. Drop us a line, cafeteriacatholicsyahoo.com. Let us know whether you like the show, whether you hate the show, whether you love uh, the show. And of course, fellow Catholics, I am your humble host, Ephraim Cortez. And this is the show, fellow Catholics, where we say what most Catholics are thinking. <clears throat> or at least we, we like to think so. But anyway, <clears throat> so this, this midterm election is coming up, fellow Catholics. Make it count. Make it count and oust these people, fellow Catholics. Okay? Oust the Democrat Party. They have caused enough damage to this great country of ours, fellow Catholics. I mean, look at it, fellow Catholics. We've got Ebola in this great country of ours, fellow Catholics. We have been reduced to a third world country here in the United States, fellow Catholics. Can't find jobs. 50 million people on welfare, 11 million people on disability, fellow Catholics. We have more people on disability in this great nation of ours than in Greece, fellow Catholics. It's time for a real change, fellow Catholics. We need people in office who will truly say, yes, we can. Yes, we can ban flights from West Africa into the United States. Yes, you can keep your doctor, truly. And hey, 
you know, it's wishful thinking. Hopefully, the Republicans, they'll get in there. And there's really, I mean, you know, President Obama, he, you know, he loves to point the finger at the Republican Party and say the Republican Party just doesn't like to work with him. But it's actually the other way around. He doesn't like to work with the Republicans. He is a, a an ideology man, right? And he continues to do and uh, uh, promote the same policies that have not worked for five years, fellow Catholics, right? Well, six years. They've not worked, and yet he keeps putting uh, money down on these, uh, these, these failing policies of his, fellow Catholics, right? He's had six years to turn it around. And instead, we have 92 million people out of work, close to 93. Some estimates say higher than that, 100 million people out of work, fellow Catholics. And if that's true, that's almost uh, half the population. It's time for a change, fellow Catholics. It is time for a change. And you know, a lot of people, hey, you know, it might get worse, fellow Catholics, because this president... You know, now he's going to have, let's say the Republicans take over the Senate. They have the Senate and the Congress, right? This will be an excuse for this president to say, well, now more than ever, I'm going to have to depend on my pen and my phone, right? To heck with the Constitution. I am going to have to rely on my executive power to do uh, what I want done, right? Because the Republicans, they just do not want to work with me. When in reality, it's Pope Obama who doesn't want to work with anyone. But with, the, uh, with, uh, with uh, those who uh, agree with him, right? And that's just about everyone in the Democrat Party, right? And yeah, I mean, you've got Democrats, you know, avoiding Obama. They don't even want to admit like Alison Grimes here in Kentucky doesn't even want to admit that she even voted for the guy, right? But if she were to beat Mitch McConnell, right, she would be the first one to buddy up with uh, Barack Hussein Obama and vote for every single policy that, uh, that, that he would put out there, fellow Catholics, okay? So don't fall for that. They love Obama. They love him. They voted for him or with him yeah, more than 90% of the time, most of these guys, okay? So they agree on ideology with Barack Hussein Obama, okay? But it's time for a change, fellow Catholics. Have you ever wondered, fellow Catholics? You know, Hollywood, right? Hollywood, you know, uh, the debauchery that you hear about in Hollywood, the sex, the divorce, right? Married one month, divorced the next month, you know. Definitely, Hollywood is not a, a, a place for, uh, you know, for our young men and women growing up, teenagers, to uh, uh, look up to, right? Uh, they, they shouldn't be looking up to uh, members of, of Hollywood, right? Of the Hollywood scene, fellow Catholics. But have you ever wondered how many Catholics we have in Hollywood? In other words, how many stars out there are actually either practicing Catholics or were raised Catholics, right? I was looking at this list the other day, and I was kind of surprised to see, I mean, most of these people are not practicing Catholics, and even the ones who say that they are practicing Catholics, you know, uh, you know, their they, they, they're public lives, uh, they're not exactly a reflection of the Catholic faith, right? But I was surprised to see how many so-called Catholics we have in Hollywood. For example, Anne Hathaway, fellow Catholics, did you know that she was Catholic? Or at least she was raised Catholic. Anne Hathaway, as a young girl, Anne Hathaway dreamed of being a nun. But the star renounced the church when her brother came out as gay. Why support an organization that has a limited view of my beloved brother? She said on the issue. And uh, first off, uh, an organization. The Catholic Church is not an organization. 
You know, that implies that the Catholic Church can simply, you know, do away with this policy or that policy the way that any other organization might be able to do so, right? Uh, this is a spiritual institution that was founded by Jesus Christ himself, right? It is an institution of doctrine, religious doctrine, doctrine that cannot be changed because it was uh, handed down to us by Jesus Christ himself, Right, just as this whole uh, uh, marriage and divorce, remarried and divorce issue, you know, this is not an issue at all, as we talked about last time on the show. This is a debate that was had 2,000 years ago, or more than 2,000 years ago, by Jesus Christ himself and the Pharisees, right? There was a debate over that, right? And Jesus Christ said, I tell you, the man who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Right? It is not an organization. It's not an organization. But anyway, Anne Hathaway, let's pray for her that she might come back to the Catholic Church because apparently she had a vocation to uh, the convent, fellow Catholics. Right? A vocation to the convent. So that's a great thing. Let's pray for... Anne Hathaway, that she come back to the church. And actually, it says uh, the star is still religious uh, as her November wedding was conducted by both a priest and a rabbi. So she's still religious, I guess. She still believes that she should be married in a religious setting, right? And I, I forgot to look at this article, uh, what year this was written. I didn't know she had gotten married. But anyway, so uh, Anne Hathaway, fellow Catholics, uh, a lapsed Catholic, right? And then we have uh, Bradley Cooper, fellow Catholics. Good actor. Good actor. Uh, and it says, uh, Born and raised Catholic, Bradley Cooper became closer to God after a brief stint in rehab. I am Catholic in my bones, he asserted in an interview last November. The star also mentioned that he prays daily and didn't lose his virginity until age of 17. Until the age of 17. That's that's a good thing, right? Which, of course, right? This is why I say that teenagers, you know, our, our young kids should not be looking up to these people. I mean, it's a great thing. You know, the guy prays every day. It's a good thing, you know, uh, considering, you know, Hollywood. But it's a good thing. He prays every day. But we should remain virgins until we are married. We should reserve ourselves for our bride and future brides. They should reserve themselves for their husbands, right? I mean, this is the way that it should work, right? But anyway, so there we have Bradley Cooper, Chris O'Donnell, Robin, right? He played Robin back, uh, seems like many years ago now, right? But actor Chris O'Donnell was raised by a devout Roman Catholic family in a small town in Illinois. Chris also attended Jesuit La uh, La uh, Loyola Academy. And so there's the problem, right? <laughs> a Jesuit school, right? But it, it, it says, uh, while less devout than his parents, he is still religious today. As an outspoken advocate for, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I've skipped over into Lady Gaga, fellow Catholics. Okay? Lady Gaga, did you know she was Catholic? As an outspoken advocate for gay rights, Lady Gaga does not uphold all the traditional values of the Catholic Church. Oh, really? Really? Well, it depends, right? I mean, she fits right in there with Cardinal Casper. Right? She fits right in there with uh, Cardinal Casper, an outspoken Advocate of homosexuality, Cardinal Casper. <laughs> is he not? Right? I mean, this is the guy that's spearheading or spearheaded that whole conversation at the Senate for the family. Right? So uh, he's for gay unions. He's for uh, gay marriage. Right? He's for that stuff. So maybe she fits right in with uh, Cardinal Gasper and other Senate fathers, right? 
As an outspoken advocate for gay rights, Lady Gaga does not uphold all the traditional values of the Catholic Church, but believe... But, but believe it or not, the star was raised Catholic. She claims to be very religious, that she believes in Jesus Christ and God and prays daily. That's a good thing. Uh, that might bring her back to uh, communion with the uh, Catholic Church. In an interview with Larry King, she said, I suppose you could say I am a quite religious woman. A quite religious woman, okay. Uh, I suppose you could, maybe she was a... Uh, a little tipsy there. I suppose you could say I am qu a, a quite religious woman that is very confused about religion. I dream of and envision a future where we have a more peaceful religion or a more peaceful world. A more peaceful religion, okay. As opposed to Catholicism? <laughs> okay, I'm, okay. So, uh, then we have George Clooney. George Clooney was raised in an extremely strict Roman Catholic household, attended Catholic schools growing up, and was an altar boy. While he was, uh, while he has stated his family was Catholic big time, he also said that he currently doesn't believe in heaven or hell, and he doesn't know if God exists. But that doesn't mean he is opposed to any religion, and in fact supports any belief that enriches a person's life makes them happy and doesn't hurt anyone. Okay, so uh, that's, you know, what else can you expect from Hollywood fellow Catholics? But, you know, that's that's cool. That's cool. Uh, Mark Wahlberg. And actually, I've heard that Mark Wahlberg is actu actually a good Catholic, right? But it says here, Mark Wahlberg is a devout and practicing Roman Catholic uh, but he wasn't always that way. At the age of 16, the singer, model, actor robbed a pharmacy while he was high on PCP and wound up knocking one man unconscious, leaving another blind in one eye and attacking a, sec a security guard. He was charged with attempted murder, fellow Catholics, and sentenced to jail. When released, Wahlberg went straight to a priest. Religion was the right choice for for Wahlberg, who after getting clean and leaving a gang, made it big. First in a boy band, New Kids on the Block. I don't remember him, a New Kids on the Block. I do remember him as a solo artist, right? Uh, and it says uh, he was a solo artist, a model, and finally on the silver screen. To all of this, he credits his faith. Being a Catholic is the most important aspect of my life. Now, that's a good witness, right? That's a good witness. The guy looks to uh, his Catholic faith. That's great. That's great. We need more of that uh, in Hollywood, fellow Catholics. And oddly enough, that list, we didn't. Uh, I didn't see uh, Jim Caviezel listed on there. I mean, the guy basically risked his entire career in order uh, that he might play Jesus Christ in the Passion of the Christ. And Mel Gibson himself told him, this might be the last movie you ever make, right? And he did it anyway. And he himself says, Jim Caviezel, he says that he has been blacklisted by Hollywood fellow Catholics because he chose to do the Passion of the Christ. A an awesome movie. An awesome movie. I could n I never tire of watching that movie, especially during Lent, right? It is a great way of meditating on those last moments of the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, watching The Passion of the Christ. I love that movie, fellow Catholics, right? Perhaps the best movie ever made... On, uh, on Jesus Christ, I believe, you know, I, I used to watch Jesus of Nazareth back when I was a kid. I, I could never understand, right, because in that movie, Jesus of Nazareth, at the end, you know, Jesus Christ, he's on the cross, and the Pharisees, you know, uh, they're saying, you know, why doesn't he come down from the cross? And as a kid who didn't really uh, understand scripture, right, Never had any catechesis as a kid. I'm thinking to myself, you know, that makes sense. Why doesn't he come down from that cross, right? And it was later that I, you know, found that uh, it was because of love, right? 
It is love that kept Jesus Christ on that cross. Love for you and I. Love for the human race. Love for his spouse, his bride, the church, fellow Catholics. He hung on that cross. It wasn't the nails that kept him on that cross. It was his love for us. His love for his bride, the Catholic Church, fellow Catholics. Right? I now understand that, fellow Catholics. As a kid, I kind of I agreed with, uh, with, with the uh, Pharisees. Right? Why doesn't he come down? We know that he can. Right? Or at least, you know, uh, I did. Right? Even as a, as a kid, uh, I knew that. Right? But the Pharisees, they, you know, even after all of the miracles, uh, and this is the astonishing thing, after all of the miracles, after all, all, all of the things that they actually saw him do, right? Here they are mocking the guy. Why doesn't he come down from that cross if he truly is the Son of God, right? And I'm thinking as a kid, well, he is the Son of God. He just walked on water, right? He just healed a leper, right? He just uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. So he is the Son of God. So why doesn't he come down from that cross? This is what I'm thinking as a kid, right? But the answer is love, fellow Catholics. It is the greatest love story ever told, fellow Catholics. And I think that uh, that aspect of the life of Jesus Christ was depicted awesomely by Mel Gibson in The Passion of the Christ, fellow Catholics. He did it out of love. The, the way he embraces that cross, right, when he falls down and that cross lands on him and he bleeds internally, right, and, you know, blood just comes out of his mouth, right? He spits up blood from the weight of the cross and he gets back up and this is the scene where his mother comes to him, right? And the, the, he, you know, Mel Gibson, he goes back and forth from the time that he was, uh, Jesus Christ was a young boy and he falls down, right? And you see these interming, intermingling shots of Jesus Christ as a boy falling down and his mother, she is there to pick him back up, right? And then as a grown man, right, with the cross, she is there to a help him lift himself back up, right? Uh, it's an awesome movie. An awesome movie, fellow Catholics, right? But you also got to see the suffering of Our Lady, the Blessed Mother, the Virgin Mary. You got to see her suffering as a mother, fellow Catholics, right? This is why we as Catholics say that she is a co-redeemer, right? Because she suffered along with Jesus Christ. She suffered along with Jesus Christ, fellow cat. But, but anyway, let's go ahead and leave it there. And we will see you next time on Cafeteria Catholics. Please pray, fellow Catholics, for the Catholic Church. Please pray for Catholics in Hollywood, fellow Catholics, right? Anne Hathaway, uh, Bradley Cooper, and all the rest of them. Mark Wahlberg and so forth. Pray for them. Pray for our bishops. Pray for our Pope, Pope Francis, especially as he has been entrusted with the task of picking a good holy bishop for the Diocese of Lexington, Kentucky. And please pray in general, fellow Catholics, and pray for this great country of ours. As you know, fellow Catholics, this great country of ours is in dire need of prayer. So please pray. God bless, fellow Catholics. See you next time. Thought I'd like to be in an orphan. I thought that I might make it on my own. Until I found myself one morning. Penniless with no place to call home. 